Japan's Slim Lander woke up briefly, turning a forest into a giant particle detector. Another explanation for that Haitian world and some stunning new pictures from Webb. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. So last week I reported that Japan's Slim Lander was face down in the regolith. And that's not correct. Actually, its engines are facing up. And what it was supposed to do was have engines facing down, and then it would flop over onto its side so that its solar panels would be facing up and would be in sunlight for the duration of the lunar day. But what happened was its engines are facing up, its nose is facing down, and the solar panels were facing away from the sun. It wasn't getting any power into its solar panels and then just in the last couple of days, the sun started to peek into the solar panels and controllers at JAXA were surprised to see that the spacecraft woke up. They were able to power on some of its instruments, communicate home with Earth, and they were able to even take a couple of pictures. But then the sun went down. And so now we've entered lunar night. And this generally takes out spacecraft. We saw this with Chinese rovers. We've seen this with the Indian lander. And so now it's going to be Jax's turn to find out if its battery system can handle being in brutal cold for two weeks. Without some kind of heating system, you really just can't keep your batteries above some minimum critical temperature. The batteries die when the sun comes back. They're not able to replenish the batteries. And so the spacecraft will be effectively dead. So it's a long shot. Maybe it'll wake up when the sun comes back in a couple of weeks and warms it back up. A forest as a neutrino telescope. All right, this is one of the coolest, weirdest ideas that I've seen in a long time. And I'm not entirely sure that this isn't some kind of elaborate prank. So I just want to set this up in advance that later on, if you see some story like science YouTuber gets fooled by elaborate early April Fool's prank, uh, I was aware that this was a risk. But there's a new paper where a scientist is proposing that you can turn a forest into a giant neutrino detector. And there's something that I didn't know is that trees can be used as radio receivers and transmitters. And so there was plenty of experiments done over the last few decades where they were able to hook up coils of wire to tree trunks and then use those to send and receive signals. And they're fine. They're perfectly acceptable receiver transmitters for radio various frequencies of radio waves. And there was sort of several military applications that this was being considered, you could imagine setting up in some forest, attaching a bunch of wires to the trees, and then using that as a way to communicate your position to home base and so on, without having to set up something more complicated. But a researcher said, could we use this ability for trees to send and receive radio frequencies for science? And so the proposal that could be used as a neutrino detector or maybe for cosmic rays, when the highest energy neutrinos decay, you get the release of various particles. And the particles has a very low flux, There's very few of these particles that are being emitted at any time in any volume. And the solution to this problem is you just make gigantic neutrino detectors. Ice cube is one cubic kilometer of ice in Antarctica, they're planning to increase it by like a factor of eight. The Chinese are planning a neutrino detector that's going to be a big chunk of the ocean. And so the proposal is that you can set up these wires onto trees, and then you can have them set up over a large area where the trees can detect the emissions from these decaying particles with a larger forest better chance at detection. And the researcher is like really trying to make sure that the point here is that you don't have to then cut down trees. And so when you look at say cosmic ray detectors, they have to set up these facilities across wide areas, they have to cut down a bunch of trees, they have to set up these buildings or detector arrays. What if you didn't have to cut down the trees at all? What if you just had to install some non invasive hardware around the trees, and then they could be your particle detector. So it's a very cool idea. And when you think about say the square kilometer array, they're tree shaped radio detectors. What if you could use trees? I don't think you can replace the square kilometer array with a forest, but it's really interesting idea on how you could use sort of naturally existing stuff on Earth as a science experiment. Another possible explanation for K 218 B. So do you remember K 218 B? This is one of the most interesting new exoplanets that has been discovered and a lot of people are talking about it. 
people have been suggesting that maybe there could be the detection of biosignatures coming from this planet. So as the person who is always attempting to steal Space Christmas, I have reported on some other possibilities in the past, and now we've got more. So the original report was that this world, K218b, might be the first example of a Haitian world, where you've got this water world which is surrounded by a thick hydrogen atmosphere, and it allows for a very habitable planet, you could have liquid water on the surface, even though this planet is receiving about the same amount of sunlight as the Earth does, you could have these Haitian worlds closer to the star farther from the star, and they would still have liquid water on their surface. And so the report that we gave you a couple of weeks ago was that another type of world one that's covered in lava, instead of liquid water would also equally explain the gases that were detected in the atmosphere by James Webb. So here's a third possibility by another group of researchers that released a paper this week, which is a gas rich mini Neptune. So when you think about planets like Uranus, Neptune, they are ice inside with a atmosphere of be ammonia, methane, other things like that. And we find smaller versions of these out there across the universe. K218b is about 2.6 times the size of the Earth, it has about 8.6 times the mass of the Earth. So it is much heavier, much bigger than Earth. And the researchers say when you look at the atmosphere profile, a mini Neptune really nicely explains the signal that they're seeing as well. And a mini Neptune seems like the simpler answer to the question of what are we seeing? So what have we got now? We've got three possibilities for this world. We've got a Haitian world with liquid ocean covered by thick atmosphere. We've got a lava world. We've got a mini Neptune. The point here is that we need to take time. We need to be patient. We need to let the astronomers gather their observations, propose different ideas, critique each other's ideas, and hopefully we will zero in on what is the correct explanation for what this world is. So if you think they found life on this planet, absolutely not. A new threat to Vera Rubin. Now we've been talking about the rise of satellite mega constellations. There are 1000s of satellites today, there will be 10s of 1000s of satellites in the future. And these are going to be impacting astronomy negatively. So we're going to have satellites passing through the field of view of telescopes as they're making their observations. It's mostly just down at the horizon during twilight or dawn. But these are the times when you're wanting to make say observations of dangerous near Earth asteroids, or if you've just got no other time that you can make these kinds of observations. And it's mostly going to impact the telescopes that are doing very rapid imaging like the Vera Rubin telescope. It's going to be taking entire views of the night sky every three days. There are going to be satellite trails in many of the images that Vera Rubin produces. And engineers are aware of this, and they've been developing a bunch of interesting solutions to solve the problems of satellite trails passing through Vera Rubin images. But a new paper came out this week from Avi Loeb. And he suggests that there's an even bigger problem that nobody is really thinking about, and that is space junk. So the European Space Agency has estimated that there are hundreds of millions of pieces of space junk between like one millimeter and one centimeter. And then there are millions of pieces that are between one centimeter and 10 centimeters. And then there are 10s of 1000s that are larger than 10 centimeters. Although these pieces of junk are tiny, they will reflect enough light that they can show up in Vera Rubin images. Vera Rubin is incredibly sensitive and taking images all the time. And so Loeb is suggesting that there could be 10s of 1000s of little trails that may show up in images from Vera Rubin. And so far, nobody is really thinking about the problem. And like, it's one thing to ask the satellite manufacturers to darken their satellites to point their solar panel arrays away to provide up to date information about when they're passing through the field of view of a telescope so that the telescope can be adapted. But it's quite another thing 
to figure out how you're going to deal with potentially millions of little pieces of space junk that are orbiting around the Earth. And this problem is already there. And it's going to get worse as more material is launched into space. So it could be that we actually find out the true magnitude of this problem later on when Vera Rubin sees first light. Every week, we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the most interesting space news. And this week, the winner loser was the fact that the Ingenuity mission was over. And it was a landslide. So thank you everybody who voted. Uh, yes, that was definitely the most important story of the week. I 100% agree with you. Now we post the vote within a couple of days that you're seeing this video to the community tab on our YouTube channel. But the best way to get it is to be subscribed to our YouTube channel, have the notification bell clicked. And then when the vote appears, you'll see it, you'll vote, and we will collate all the votes and tell you next week. 19 spiral galaxies from James Webb. All right, we like to show you new pictures from the James Webb Space Telescope, but this is kind of ridiculous. Here are 19 images of spiral galaxies seen by James Webb. And each one of these is sort of beautiful and interesting in its own point. And so we'll have a link in the show notes, so you can go and find all of the different images and stare at each one slack jawed. They're amazing. So these galaxies were captured as part of a survey by James Webb called the physics at high angular resolution in nearby galaxies or fangs program. So while astronomers have time on James Webb to do specific observations, there are these larger surveys that are being done of these spiral galaxies, as well as looking at galaxies in the early universe. And so with the FANGS program, they're looking at galaxies that are relatively nearby, and they're trying to identify regions of star formation in those galaxies. And so now astronomers have cataloged about 100,000 star forming regions across various galaxies in our nearby vicinity. And they're going to be able to use this to really start to understand how star formation works at different ages of the universe how you go from just a big blob cloud of gas and dust to a star cluster to a place like the sun with planets. And speaking of star formation, here's an even closer image of one type of those star forming regions. This is a nebula called N79. And it's located in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's about 160,000 light years away. For some weird reason, the Large Magellanic Cloud has just an intense amount of star formation. You're probably familiar with the Tarantula Nebula, which is like one of the biggest most intense star forming regions that we know of some of the largest stars that have ever been and observed are in the Tarantula Nebula. N79 is like the Tarantula Nebula's little brother. It's close by, but is a lot younger, and it actually has more intense star forming activity inside of it. And it's believed that it's only about 500,000 years old. And yet you can see there are knots of star formation, brand new stars, which probably have brand new planets orbiting around them. Really, this is the soonest you can see a star forming region start to come to life. Another amazing picture from James Webb. In addition to Space Bites and The Question Show, we've been producing a ton of interviews. And in fact, there is a tsunami of interviews coming your way. A few of them I feel have been really special, like the interview that I just did with Nobel Prize winner Adam Reese about how he uses James Webb to measure Cepheid variables to provide the most accurate measurement of the expansion rate of the universe, try to help solve the Hubble tension. It was an amazing interview. And if you haven't seen it already, I highly recommend it. I want to talk a little bit more about what these interviews mean to me and sort of creativity and why I think people are retiring from YouTube. And we'll talk about that at the end of this episode. So stick around for that. Lisa gets the green light. This week, the European Space Agency announced that it is officially going ahead with the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna or LISA. And this is a next generation gravitational wave observatory that's going to be going to space. It consists of three identical spacecraft that form this gigantic triangle in space, they'll be sending laser signals back and forth between each of the satellites. And then as a gravitational wave passes over them, it'll change the length of the arms of the triangle, allowing Lisa to detect the gravitational wave. The hope is that Lisa will be able to detect gravitational waves that are much longer wavelength. And so while say the ground based observatories are able to detect colliding black holes, colliding neutron stars, colliding black hole neutron stars, 
maybe Lisa will be able to detect supermassive black holes that are merging across the universe. And so like one of the big questions is how did supermassive black holes get so massive? How often do they merge? What are the sizes that they're merging together? And so hopefully Lisa will be able to answer that question. And the European Space Agency is like so committed to this path that they launched the Lisa Pathfinder mission and recently wrapped it up where they tested out all of the different pieces of technology that they would need to make sure that Lisa was going to work. They were really happy with the results. And so this week, they announced that they're moving ahead with the full official Lisa launch. Now, if everything goes well, they'll begin the design and assembly in 2025. So just a couple of years away, and they should be on track for launch in 2035. Now I know that sounds like forever, like 11 years wait before we have a space based gravitational wave observatory. But I've been talking about Lisa for like a decade already. And so for me, it's just around the corner now I can't wait. A space station will launch on Starship. In a recent question show, someone asked me, what are the plans after the International Space Station gets deorbited? If you haven't heard the news, it's probably going to get deorbited by the end of this decade. Well, you've got the Chinese Space Agency, as well as NASA is going to be working on the Lunar Gateway, but there won't be a NASA low Earth orbit space station. But there are a couple of commercial options that are hoping to put a private space station into orbit before the ISS is wrapped up, maybe even having some of the ISS components join this private space station, and then they can take over the maintenance and, and sending cargo to and from and handling all of that. So this week, we got the announcement from a company called Starlab that they're going to be launching their own private space station. And in fact, the station is so big, that it will only be able to be launched on a starship. So they have already I guess what put down their deposit on a starship, I guess they need to see if the starship works first. But if all goes well, we will see a new space station be launched on Starship. And their hope is to have this up and operational before ISS gets deorbited. So there will still be a platform in space where people can go and do science experiments, space tourism, things like that. Now I'm going to talk about creativity and YouTube retirement in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Paul Rohrbach, Abe Kingston, Hey Twyla, Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Ansis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiplin, Modso, George, David Gilson, Andrew M. Gross, Jeremy Matter, Josh Schultz, Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. So I've had a bunch of people asking me, like, what do you think about all of the YouTubers retiring? And what does that mean? And the thing that you hear from a lot of people is that they are burnt out and that you get to a certain point where you build the organization larger, and then you are a slave to the algorithm. And you've got all of these requirements that you have to do to sort of maintain your team and deal with all this stuff. And I feel all that, right? Like, it's not just me, I've got people who work with me on the team, I've got writers at Universe Today, and there's all of the administration and taxes and all the stuff that we have to do. And if all I was doing was fulfilling what the algorithm wanted from me, I would be pretty burnt out too. I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years now. So I don't know if this will help anybody. But the thing that I do is that I ignore that. And instead, I just do what I think is most fun and most interesting and I get to follow my own curiosity. And the way you see that expressed on this channel is me getting a chance to interview people and ask them questions about what they're working on. That's the thing that I enjoy the most. And that kind of replenishes my fondness and enjoyment for being a space reporter. And that's what got me into it in the first place being curious. And so as long as I get to keep fulfilling my curiosity, then everything's gonna be fine. And like if nobody watched the interviews, I wouldn't care because I would still want to do them. So as long as I have time to do the interviews, then everything's going to be fine. And I will keep doing this job for the rest of my life. So if anyone out there is like struggling, like, what do I do? I'm feeling kind of burnt out. Just do the thing that you love the most. Follow your creativity, follow your curiosity. Don't become a slave to the algorithm. It's okay. 